Welcome to today's session for the EWOP Impact Incubator and the British Psychological Society's Division of Occupational Psychology. It's an event that's looking from decent wages to decent work. I'm just going to wait for a few minutes because I can see a number of people who are joining this session and a very big welcome to you. Our session today is going to be focusing on this really important topic of decent wages. And if you're interested, you can also visit the EWOP Impact Incubator, where you'll see a whole variety of different resources, including our YouTube channel, where we place all of our previous recordings on the site. But also we have policy documents, we have um, freely available uh, papers, uh, as well as our animations and shortly our serious educational game on this topic. But all of these are available at no charge to you on the EWOP Impact Incubator site. So welcome to today's session. I can see we've reached a critical mass and it's lovely to see so many of you putting where you're from on the chat. So welcome very much to our colleagues in South Africa, in Portugal and in Thailand and the UK and more widely. So please add where you're from to other chats so that we can name check your country because this is a topic that definitely has a global reach. And many of you are part of a program called Project Globe, which is the project Global Living Organizational Wage and really resonating about the significance of this. So we've got Romania, we've got Ireland, so you're all incredibly welcome to this joint session run today by the EWOP Impact Incubator, the British Psychological Society's Division of Occupational Psychology, and also the Economic and Social Research Council, the University of Glasgow's Adam Smith Business School, Edinburgh, the University of Edinburgh's Business School, and Living Wage Scotland. So my name is Rosalind Searle. And I am direct, I have the privilege of being the director for the EWOP Impact Incubator. So this session today is something that has been incredibly important to the Impact Incubator since we were formed in November 2020. So let me give you a few housekeeping details. As you'll be aware, this session is being recorded and so we'd like you to keep your audio and camera off unless you're speaking. 
All of the questions can be added into the chat function and we will use those to ask Sharon and I'll be asked, um, answering questions for Ishbel about our two speakers. So also, can you raise any queries or concerns in the chat function? We will be recording this session and we'll be using it later as part of our YouTube channel of further interest to you. So why are we looking at decent work? Well, decent work is one of the critical strands for the EWOP Impact Incubator. As we started, the pandemic was just kicking off and we felt it was such an important topic around what makes work decent for people. And so as a result of that, you'll see there's a variety of different resources available for you. But really it's highlighting how for psychology and more widely, work meets fundamental needs for human beings. It's critically important to our well-being, both economic and mental, and to providing equal opportunities and fairness that allow people to become who they are and to share and participate in the societies in which they are part of. It's all about providing an and fair income for people so that they can see a connection between the, the effort that they put in and the resources and remuneration that they get out. It's also, and this is a, a key component in terms of thinking through the United Nations, is also a goal in terms of sustainable development that should be about achieving full and productive employment and decent work for all men and women, for everybody. And that includes both young people. And again, you'll see one of the strands on the EWOP Impact Incubator is around young people and work, but also people with disabilities and making sure that we have equal pay for equal work of equal value. Our journey has really led us around a whole range of different topics, but you'll see this is a really pressing issue that particularly as people are flashing in facing inflation rate pressures and food crises, it's starting to become important. So these are just some headlines from around the UK. And uh, yesterday, one of our uh, large supermarkets um, was featured in the paper around saying, well, you appear to have some um, draws in terms of looking at your social provision, but actually when we dig down into the details, you're not providing a living wage for everyone who works for you. And this is important both in terms of soaring food prices and how farmers are being remunerated for their food. It's about thinking through how we pay realistically for food that's available to us. And we can see that the uh, current war in Ukraine is meaning that the viability of food all over the world is now starting to come into question. So we know within Europe specifically, that poverty is on the rise and it's likely to rise further as a result of things that are happening further into the east. It's also critically important in terms of how people are having to repurpose their incomes to focus more on energy again as those costs spiral. So what we're seeing is that people just don't have money available as they have done in the past and we're seeing also huge differentiation between those who have high value work and those who have either no work or who are working, but also on benefits. So really this hoarding of resources has huge implications for societies as a whole. So our journey within the EWOP Impact Incubator began in 2018 when we put together this call um, for a special group and the small group meeting met in 2019 in Glasgow, and we came together a whole series of researchers from all over the world. And as a result of that, we put together these briefing packs. Again, these are available at the EWOP Impact Incubator that talk about not only what a living wage is, but also provide a checklist for HR professionals and for organizations to understand why it matters. We also uh, created something um, on the conversation that again shows why, in particularly in terms of COVID, this is a critical issue for us going forward and partnered with Living Wage Scotland in their Living Wage Week. We've gone through to do that each year and so last year we launched our animation 
Um, and again, this is available in a whole variety of different languages and it's freely available on our website for you to use. And we also have produced a special issue with uh, partners, the European Journal of Work and Organisational Psychology on this topic. We were very delighted uh, last November to work with um, Scotland's capital city, Edinburgh, as they became a living wage space and we have an ongoing project helping to work with them to identify what organisations can actually do and educate. So our programme today, and I'm really not going to take up any further time, I've introduced this. I'm then going to hand over to Sharon Parker, who is one of the most eminent psychologists and actual researchers across the planet, as she really does not need any introduction from me because of the quality and diversity of her work, particularly in this area. And she's going to be highlighting her um, contribution, particularly around work design and this smart work design. We're then going to have a Q&A session and then a short screen break because we're working online. And then uh, we're going to launch our serious educational game. This was supposed to be Ishbel, but sadly Ishbel has COVID. So I'm going to do that session and then we'll have a final wrap. So without further ado, I'd really like to hand over now to Sharon Parker. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much, Roz, and thanks everyone um, for coming on board. Um, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk actually not so much about the wage side of decent work, but the sort of what is it that makes decent work from a psychological perspective. So I will just um, get my screen showing. And if someone can just let me know when you can see that. Um, is that coming up, Roz, can you see that? Yes, fantastic. All right, so, um, so I'm going to introduce today a particular model, um, the smart work design model, um, as a sort of shorthand way of summarizing some of the key research in this area. But before I do, I'd first like to acknowledge that I come to you today from the land of the Wujak people of the Noongar Nation here in Australia. Um, and I pay my respects to leaders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm actually from Curtin University here in Perth in Western Australia. And for those of you who don't know um, me or our team, um, I'm part of something, I lead something called the Centre for Transformative Work Design, uh, where we, we do a lot of research on this topic that I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about. So the first thing is to note that I'm not claiming work design is the only vehicle to decent work. It's one vehicle to, to decent work. And it's the one that I'll focus on today. What is work design? Here's an academic definition. The content and organizing of tasks, activities, relationships, res and responsibilities within a job or role, or a, a group or a set of jobs and roles. That's a pretty academic definition. And so um, one of the things that we've done in recent times is create this smart model to unpack what that means. I do just wanna make the point though, that um, compared to something like leadership, for example, which you know there are many, many books written on and everybody understands is really important. Work design tends to be a little bit of a neglected strategy in organizations. And I just wanna share with you, this is a, a real tweet that I, I saw um, a year or two ago, and he, here's an employee saying, I want growth in my role. Company installs ping pong table and autonomy, says the employee. Their response is, oh, we, we've given you a fully stocked snack room. Um, what about if fulfillment, says the employee. Oh, what about a live DJ in the office, says the company. The employee quits and then... Um, the company concludes, well, some people just aren't a good culture fit. And I like that little example there because it highlights one of the challenges, I guess, is that when people are struggling or wanting certain things in their work to make it decent, um, sometimes the responses from organisations are, are less than helpful. Um, here, I, I often think of it as a sort of iceberg and in a sense, what we can see, what's visible above the iceberg sometimes is stress, but then we see, and they need to get a little bit of feedback on how they are uh, doing. 
it helps to generate mastery if you're also doing a whole job so not just a tiny little fragment but a whole job where you can see the consequences of your actions a is for agency and this is um, recognizing the importance of human autonomy having control or influence or involvement um, in aspects of your work R is for relational, and I guess we've learned this through COVID, the importance of social connection at work and, you know, lots of discussion about whether remote work is sufficient to fulfil those relational needs that we all have. So designing work where people have social contact, where they can connect with the end users of the work, where they've got support and where they're part of a team. And then finally, T is, I often say, the big one, certainly um, here in Australia, a lot of very overloaded people um, in work right now. So T is about having demands at work that are tolerable. And this really just recognises the idea that everyone has demands at work. It's sort of the definition of work. But those demands need to be, they need to feel manageable. They need to feel tolerable, whether those demands are workload or pressure or the number of hours you work or, or other aspects of the work. And together that gives rise to this acronym of SMART. Um, there's a huge amount of research on work design for anyone who's not familiar with the topic, linking the sort of aspects that I've just talked about to outcomes like mental health, depression, burnout, and I'll give some examples as we go forward. But also really important for motivation, performance, creativity, proactivity, um, these sorts of outcomes. And, and finally, and I'll give some also some examples of, of this as I go through, um, smart work is really important for fostering human growth and learning and use of talent. Um, so let me now talk a little bit more about stimulating. And that's what I would like to do is really unpack each of those. And I'll give some examples also of change um, in these dimensions of work. Uh, you'll see as we go through some um, sketches and uh, these sketches come from a project that we initiated a few years ago to actually try to depict work design by interviewing people just everyday people doing all sorts of work and then um, capturing some of their comments about work. And you can see these are hospital supply workers. So these are the people who take supplies to the hospital and you can see them saying things like, there's never a dull moment. I like the variety, you know, highlighting, valuing the stimulating aspect of work. Well, this job teaches me a lot. So that's the stimulating aspect of work. Um, not all work is stimulating. And here you can see a picture of a um, Uber Eats deliverer talking about actually the problem with the job being it's boring because there's so much time just spent waiting. Um, and unfortunately, lack of stimulation in work is surprisingly common. Uh, um, if you look at the levels of overqualification, which is when people feel that they've got more qualifications than they're actually using um, in their work. Those levels are surprisingly high. Um, and at least in Australia, amongst graduates are about 30%. Uh, so that's a lot of wasted talent. So what happens if you've got unstimulating work? Well, you can see that it's partly related to burnout. And I mentioned this link of work design with mental health, but you can also see that people get disengaged. It can affect things like musculoskeletal injuries because you're doing the same things over and over again. They're not growing. Um, this phenomenon called bore out. And I like to share the example of a French guy who um, was so unstimulated in his work that he sued the company for being bored. Um, so rather than burn out, bore out and actually um, was successful in his, in his claim. You can also see it's not just risky for individuals, but it's risky for organisations as well. And one of the biggest risks, I think, is wasted talent. Um, and I like to give the example, if you can see that book up there in the right hand corner of a, of a female um, 
who had a um, PhD, and I've forgotten in what, maybe sociology, not sure, but who decided to go undercover in the US and see if she could live off the, off the, um, the, the bottom wage. Um, and that's what the book was about. And it's a really great book if you haven't read it. But what was really interesting to me was that she made a commitment to herself that in, in the jobs that she went into, she did this for six months and she worked at Walmart and she did cleaning and she did these sorts of sort of what we would call low skill jobs. Um, what was interesting was that she made a commitment that she would, she would do the job to the best of her ability. And she believed that someone would notice that she was a, you know, smart, educated person. And in the whole time that she did the experiment, nobody noticed. And I think that's one of the problems with um, work that is not stimulating, is that you never discover the talent that people have because they don't have the opportunity to show it. Uh, you can see it also affects other outcomes. And another example is a return to work after injury. Uh, if people have been injured, um, they don't want to go back to a boring job and they're much slower to return to work as you might expect. So that's stimulating. Um, and I just wanted to share some research we've been looking at um, recently, which is what's the impact of stimulating work on cognition? Um, and some of you will be familiar with this. Um, actually, it says um, Lee Gertel 2015, but this research actually came um, about in the 1960s where the, the the sort of neuronal development of um, brains in rats was examined when they were in these sort of more um, boring cages versus when they were in a more stimulating cage. And what you can see is that there was a lot more development of the nerve, nerve cells in the rats' brains when they were in these stimulating environments. And I guess that sort of basic idea has really intrigued me can we take that idea and apply it to the office and perhaps if people are in these really boring routine jobs uh, we see less brain development compared to uh, people in these enriched um, uh, and you know stimulating work environments uh, well we haven't actually measured people's brains yet <laughs> um, but we did um, my colleagues and I those of you are academics we have a fully-fledged review paper in the Academy of Management Annals uh, that came out last year, link, looking at how the design of work relates to cognition. Um, and we just had that um, a sort of summary of this work, I guess, published in the, um, the Sloan Management Review. And really, it's just this simple idea that smart work might make you smarter. Um, and so if anyone is interested, I'm happy to um, link that paper at the end of the session. So that's stimulating work, really important. Um, but now, what about mastery? So mastery is about, as I said before, it's about, you know, what do you need to, to know? What information do you need in your work to be able to do your job well? Well, you need to know what it is that you're meant to be doing. You need to have clarity about your roles and responsibilities. You need to get some feedback. Um, and it, of course, helps to understand where your work fits into the bigger picture. And you can see there an aged care assistant talking about how important it is to get some, some feedback at work. Uh, that really says the same thing. Um, so lots of evidence, again, about the importance of these sorts of aspects of work design. So for example, a meta-analysis of 33 studies showing if you don't know what it is you're meant to be doing at work, it's quite depressing. Um, so role clarity is important for mental health at work. And you can see some other meta-analyses linking role, a lack of clarity to burnout and also a lack of feedback. If you don't have that clarity, if you don't get the feedback, it's stressful, it's dissatisfying, you're less likely to learn. Unsurprisingly, if you don't get feedback, how can you learn? Uh, and it obviously affects things like organisational agility. How can the organisation adapt and change and be agile? Like think about organisations during COVID. If people are not getting the knowledge they need to do their job and the feedback on how they are um, developing. So just to give an exa example, and I guess 
the reason personally I've always been excited about the topic of work design is because you can change work, you can redesign work. Uh, so here's an example of some um, uh, surgical teams, uh, a study that we um, did, where we looked at, um, so typically be before this intervention, you would have um, a surgical team would literally just turn up and start the surgical list for the day. So you'd have anaesthetists, you'd have nurses, you would have the surgeons, often turning up, not even necessarily knowing each other's names, not having discussed any sort of plan for the day. Um, and so um, this intervention was very simple. It was really about before the surgical list, before it started for the day, come together for five minutes, those different professionals. So in this particular organization, the nurses met separately. Um, the anesthetists would meet amongst themselves, but they didn't meet together. So the intervention was that the different professions would come together literally for five minutes to have a quick run through of the day to plan roles. So which nurse will do what and um, to discuss the cases um, and, um, um, and, and, and see whether this could actually improve the quality of the teamwork. And particularly we were interested in um, reducing those errors that occur because people don't know what each other is meant to be doing and so they don't communicate effectively. And what you can see is that, um, and I'll just read one quote from a surgeon, you know, I feel unhappy if I haven't done a briefing. This is him talking after um, the intervention. Um, it's a bit like getting into a car and not putting a seatbelt on. You don't feel safe. You just feel like something is missing. And you can see similar positive comments from the anaesthetist and the nurse. So when people had role clarity and they knew what the plan was and they knew who was doing what, they basically just felt better about their work um, and, and felt that they were more effective as a team. We, of course, as good psychologists, <laughs> measured all these things before and after. We showed that um, staff engagement was higher. We showed a 50% reduction in delays, um, which actually uh, resulted in multi-millions of dollars saved because surgery is very expensive. Um, and we also saw more safety communication and communication across the professional boundaries. And all of these results were even stronger if the briefings um, were high quality because we measured the quality of the briefings as well. So this is an example of how if you give more clarity to people in their work, more mastery, um, it has good outcomes. Turning now to A, A is about agency. Um, and I always like to share how we, we, you know, you might be more familiar with the concept of autonomy, but here in Western Australia, where autonomous mining and um, is very big, um, we, we got sick of saying, no, by autonomy, we mean human autonomy. So we instead refer now to agency and the importance of humans having some influence some control over their work. And you can see here a depiction of an academic. And as you would probably know, academics often are academics for the autonomy. That's what we love and cherish. But here's an academic who feels that because of a centralization strategy in the university, that they've lost their autonomy. And you can see this academic is saying, you know, what I really want in my next job is um, a unit with autonomy to make decisions I'm exiting. Um, so autonomy is very important, not just to academics, but, but to, to most workers. So what we want to do is design work where people have got control over when they do things, the timing and the scheduling of their tasks, the methods of their work, um, and they can use some of their initiative and, and make decisions. What we don't want is when people have got no flexibility or input into their schedules or their work, when, they, when there's so much bureaucracy and red tape that they can't make any decisions about how they do their work, or for example, they might be micromanaged um, by their supervisors. What are the risks if you don't give people agency at work? Well, stress is a big one. Um, if you want to create stress for people, take away their control and especially throw in some demands and that really makes for a great recipe for stress. 
So um, disengagement, turnover, you saw an example of that with the academic, but that's borne out by research as well. Um, and you can see that little picture there um, of um, somebody who um, I would say lacks ownership. So in fact, this was actually research that I did in my PhD a million years ago, which um, was all about how if you give people autonomy, they develop more of a um, broader sense of ownership for their job and they care about it more and they take more responsibility. If you, if you narrow people's uh, autonomy and agency, then they develop a bit more of a that's not my job mindset and, and uh, engage in the sort of behaviour suggested by this white line here. So um, autonomy is very important uh, from mental health. Um, I won't go through this example in too much detail because many of you I hope will be familiar with it. And this is the example of Bert Sorg, which is um, a, a different way of providing uh, care to people uh, in the community. Um, and really a uh, well-known example, and actually we're involved here in some research uh, in, in aged care uh, because the, uh, the um, level of burnout in aged care jobs here in Australia is, is astronomical. Um, and, and the sorts of ideas that are being looked at are this sort of Burtzorg idea. And, and what happened with Burtzorg, um, which has become, as I say, a popular model, is that, you know, instead of a traditional um, approach where some people might, you know, do the bandages, but some other people might help somebody with their food and somebody else might do the cleaning, and then you get these big cracks between the service um, and the support that the that the, the residents need, um, they introduce a sort of self-managing team model where uh, a, a group of 12 educated nurses and allied health professionals would provide complete care for a whole neighbourhood and have a lot of autonomy about when they visited people and who they visited, have also autonomy agency over their budgets and so on and so forth. Um, and anyone who's interested, again, there's a lot written about this particular example, but huge benefits. You can see 40% reduction in client costs, hugely reduced overheads because you're not paying for layers and layers of supervision. Um, being the best, this Burtzorg has been the best employer of the year for many years. Lots of satisfaction. As I say, it's spread to other countries. There was a big analysis done by some consultants. I think it was yeah, KPMG. Um, and they actually um, really analysed this in great depth and showed that actually the cost per client of delivering this care was actually less, uh, contrary to what um, a lot of people might have expected. Moving now to R, and this is about the importance of relational aspects in work, making sure people feel supported, that they belong, that they're part of a team. Um, and you can see they're a childcare worker talking about you know, being part of a supportive team is so important. Uh, and of course, the opposite we all know is if you're in a work environment where you are bullied or harassed or not supported, um, you know, it is very stressful and um, you know, has consequences for workers' compensation and all sorts of things. So here you can see a dancer um, actually talking about how you're constantly being criticized put down, etc. And um, we would predict that that dancer would suffer from distress, want to leave, etc. And a great deal of research linking a lack of social support and things like bullying to outcomes like burnout. Um, just to give an example, again, of a um, relational intervention, and those of you familiar with Adam Grant might know about this particular study. So this is a study um, looking at people who work in call centres, who you would know if you know anything about call centre work, it's a notoriously challenging job with a lot of turnover um, and um, can be quite a tightly scripted job. You've got to very low agency, also low stimulation because you've got to answer hundreds of calls. 
So in this particular study, what um, Adam Grant and his colleagues did was they actually helped these call centre agents to understand how their work was actually helping people. So these call centre agents' job was to generate um, money, so to get money from alumni actually at a university, and that money was then used to help give people scholarships from disadvantaged backgrounds. And so in this particular study, people got the opportunity to meet or read letters from these scholarship recipients. And so what they came to learn was that their work had a positive impact on other people's lives. Um, and there were many positive benefits. So, um, and, and Adam Grant talks about this as contact with the beneficiaries or the people who benefit from the work. Um, what they found um, as a result of this intervention, very simple intervention, was that people stayed on the phone longer, they tried harder. In other words, that's like a measure of effort and 171% more money raised um, as a consequence. So uh, human beings want to connect with other people. They want to, they want to help them. And one way we can redesign work to make it more relational is to help people to see the impact of their work on others' lives. Um, another example, and this is one of um, our studies, um, we did a, a study with junior doctors and um, these were junior doctors who were working on the overtime shift. So they come in at five o'clock at night when all the bosses and everything have gone home and their job um, was to sort of run that shift. And we were finding that the, the junior medical officers were stressed and suffering and feeling very unsupported um, because the bosses had gone home and they honestly didn't really know necessarily what they were doing. Um, so this intervention was about introducing some social support into the system. So an advanced practice nurse role was introduced and the role of that nurse was actually to help the junior doctors. So help them learn, do some particular medical tasks um, help them deal with things like emergencies because the nurses really understood the system. They'd worked there for 20 years or whatever. Um, but often the junior doctors, you know, they didn't understand the, all the departments and all the politics. And the, the, the advanced practice nurse would also just help um, prioritise which is the most important issue. So just really provided support practical support, emotional support to, to the junior doctors. And we found um, really positive benefits for those junior doctors. Actually, we found slightly different results for stressed versus non-stressed junior doctors. The ones that were not stressed, they really benefited in terms of when the nurse was on shift, and that was how we did the study. We actually measured the same people when the nurse was on shift and when the nurse was not on shift um, and then compared their experiences. Um, and the non-stress doctors, when the nurse was on the shift, um, they had a lot lower roll overload, you can see. And you can see by this quote, you know, saying well, it's difficult to ask the registrars, that's the bosses or other junior medical officers if you've got difficult cannulas or things that are definitely your job because you know they're busier than you are and their priorities are different. So it's great to have someone you can ask for help. So um, the support that the, the junior doctors uh, offered really made a big difference. For the stress doctors, you can see also um, that when they had the nurse on shift, which is the purple here, they were able to deliver much better quality care and they also felt more confident in speaking out about issues, um, which was really important. So there's another example of how you can change work design to, to improve. Um, and coming now to the big one I said was T, which was having demands at work, whether they're emotional or cognitive or um, just the amount of work, those demands need to be tolerable. And you can see a geneticist here on the left saying, well, time pressure is the biggest demand. And you can see here a surgeon on the right saying, actually, it's the emotional stuff that's the biggest demand. Whatever the demands are, it's really important to make sure they are experienced as tolerable for people. Um, because, of course, high demands, high pressure is a really big driver of stress. It's been linked to things like cardiovascular disease, burnout, 
um, um, also things like homework conflict um, and uh, workers' compensation is a huge one um, in Australia, and I'm sure it's true there. The fastest growing category of workers' compensation claims are mental health related ones that work. And then within that, the biggest category is job pressure or job demands. Um, so all sorts of risks if the demands are not tolerable. So again, what can you do about that? And I just want to give the example here of a particular group of workers, fairly unique. Um, actually, you might have them in Glasgow, um, but certainly in Australia, we have these workers called FIFO workers, which are fly in, fly out workers. So they will fly thousands of miles out into the middle of the desert and then stay on site for two or three or four weeks and then they fly back to be with their family. And we've found that those workers have exceptionally high levels of psychological distress. You can see one third of them have very high psychological distress. That actually went up to 40% during COVID um, versus the norm data, you know, normally would be 10 to 17% of people would have that high distress. But what's interesting is, well, that was very interesting clinically because a lot of people would try to say there's something about FIFO workers that, um, you know, I don't know, they suffer more for some reason or other. But if you look here at the data for distress as a function of the sort of rosters that people are on, what you can see very clearly is that the people who are away from their families, so they have four weeks on, that means four weeks up on the mine site or wherever, away from their family and then one week off, um, or three weeks on, one week, you can see their level of psychological distress is way greater than these people who are, who've got much more balanced rosters. So, um, and in this case, one organisation um, was, was actually launching a trial to change the rosters for the FIFO workers. So that's an example of how you can uh, redesign work to address demands. And here's another example some of you might be familiar with it. Um, this is this is about this is a um, example of a study um, that BMW, I think it was in Germany, um, were um, finding that because as people were aging, um, the production workers were really finding that the physical demands of the job were getting too much. And they actually did a participative sort of intervention, which involved the workers in coming up with small changes, but to make the work um, less physically demanding. Just very simple things like they would put uh, they would put magnifying glasses on the instruction uh, on, you know, so that they could really easily read them. They had little bar stools that they could sort of perch on while they did the work and so on. They introduced 70 or more changes and um, actually showed that the, the, work, the, the mature workers that were working on, these, um, on this particular line were actually able to then keep up. And I think maybe, I can't quite remember, but I think they even outperformed some of the other workers. I do just want to say one important thing about when you're trying to make demands more tolerable. Sometimes, and we certainly face this when we try to make demands more tolerable in the aged care sector in Australia, it's very difficult to change the demands because the demands are very much affected by the funding models for staffing in aged care, as an example. But one thing that can make demands feel more tolerable is to increase the SMAR aspects of the work. So if people have got high demands, but they've also got um, high levels of stimulating mastery, agency, support, relational aspects, those, de those same demands will feel a lot more tolerable. So it's really important to remember, it's um, creating tolerable demands isn't just about reducing the demands, that can sometimes be the best thing, but sometimes that's not possible. But increasing those other SMAR aspects um, can make the demands more tolerable. Unfortunately, uh, this is a little bit old, this data, because this is a 2010 European Working Conditions Survey, and there's been one since, uh, but the data haven't changed very much. There's plenty of people that still have not got decent work, according to the SMART model. So around about a half of the sample have either got jobs that are um, very intense, so lacking that tolerable demands, 
or they are boring and, you know, not very good on the SMAR. So I've gone through this model fairly quickly and I'm keen to discuss things. So I'm going to stop in just a minute. Um, so there's lots of ways you can use this model. You can, we do a lot of work with organisations who are having workers suffer from burnout. So it can be used from a mental health and wellbeing perspective. It can also be used from a performance perspective. As I said, right at the beginning, um, if you've got poor work design, it's probably going to affect your performance. So really understanding that is important. Um, we've got huge discussions now around the great resignation, lots and lots of people realizing that they really want decent work in their lives. Um, so this model can really help um, to address that. We often give examples of how you can make work smart, whether people are working from home or doing hybrid work. Um, and the other thing is increasingly, as we go into the future with more digital technology, with more automation and AI and so on, we have to be thinking about what's the impact on the humans in the system and making sure that the digital technology um, does, does not eradicate um, or undermine the smart work. We've got lots of resources on our website that you're very welcome uh, to, to uh, address. And just to summarise, I just wanted to share um, a, a story of um, the person that inspired actually this whole sketching initiative that I mentioned earlier, where we, we decided to sketch work design. And it was a guy who worked on a, on a landfill site. Um, his name is Jeremy, close to where actually I, we go on holidays. And um, he was somebody who works in a rubbish um, site, basically. And yet you can see that he scored his job is nine out of 10. And he actually, one of the things that he did was he created beautiful artwork out of a lot of the materials that were left at the rubbish site and, and created really beautiful space. Um, and I just think he's a lovely example of how it doesn't matter what sort of work it is, you can actually create smart work. So for him, you know, he did a lot of recycling and he, that made his work stimulating because he felt he was really doing his bit for the planet. Um, he felt he had a lot of mastery because he was part of the local community. And as he said there, the, the locals, they let me know whether I'm doing a good job. He had enormous autonomy. And um, he said, I have freedom. It's up to me how I do things. He said, this place is a social hub, particularly during the holiday time, because everybody would bring their rubbish and drop by and, and have a chat with Jeremy and he, he had very tolerable demands. He had plenty of resources and, and free time. So um, I think just a really nice example to show smart work design isn't the province of the lawyers and the doctors. Um, smart work design is accessible uh, to all workers. Oh, and by the way, um, also generated those smart outcomes that I mentioned. So here's a local customer saying, you know, the tip, it used to be revolting, all the rubbish just in one big pit, and it's 100% better now because Jeremy had had such pride in his work that he'd created all these different piles and sorted it all out and made it, you know, strangely a quite beautiful uh, place. And that's it from me. So I hope that has been interesting to you and um, very happy to answer some questions. I'd love it if you connect with me on LinkedIn. Sharon K. Parker, and I always put my research up there. Thank you. Over to you, Roz. Thank you ever so much for such a stimulating uh, talk. And you've definitely got a load of people asking for more resources. So again, thank you for sharing those with us. I'm just going to read some of the questions that people have posed. And please Great. put your questions into the chat. So um, a comment has come out um, to do with is there such a thing as too much of a good thing effect when it comes to autonomy, where workers can start to feel overwhelmed by having too much decision making freedom? I'm so, so glad the that other whoever <laughs> asked. Yeah, I'm so glad whoever asked that asked that question because actually I have a PhD student who has um, actually been looking at that question and first did a meta analysis um, of the literature, but also has done some experiments and exactly. Ex you know, you find that that very high level of autonomy can create a demand. Now, sometimes the curve is just flat. So it's like, um, you know, you get a benefit of more and more autonomy and then it just flattens out. 
But actually for some, the, the, the benefits actually become negative at very high levels. And partly it is because as the person speculated, you know, it can get overwhelming to have too much choice. We also think sometimes a lot of autonomy can also be a little bit of a manager abdication. You know, sometimes it can be a little bit confounded with that. Um, but uh, so yes, at the very extreme, I mean, and it's of course relatively small number of people who fall into that category, but it's an excellent question. So there is too much of a good thing. <laughs> um, and I think the other thing I'd always say with the SMART model, it is about balance across all of those, or maybe balance is not the right word, but it is about holistically looking at all of them because, you know, it's like if we look at um, working from home, you know, on the one hand, it's maybe you've got much more agency, that's fabulous, but maybe you've also got less relational connection with people mm. if that's all you do, you know, so, so it's about looking at the whole. Um, yeah. So yeah, but thank you. Great question. No, great question. We've got a question from South Africa um, that maybe um, you can answer, but I, I don't know because your work isn't necessarily in this, but they're, they're asking, you know, in South Africa, we have around 50% unemployment and whilst everyone is in agreement with decent work and decent wages, is there a way that one trumps the other? So is it better to have decent work or decent wages? Yeah, and I'm tempted here to mention Maslow, although I know that Maslow's need hierarchy has been sort of disproved. But, you know, in some sense, is that what, what we're talking about really is like satisfying is, is satisfying those sort of sort of um, survival needs almost potentially more important than these psychological needs. Um, and I don't really know the answer to that question. I do know that there is a study that shows that having bad work, as in really unsmart work, is just as stressful as being unemployed. So, so there is some evidence that, you know, being unemployed, having a really bad job, they're pretty on par. Um, I guess the benefit would be that even if you've got really bad work, at least you're getting that financial component. Um, so it's a, but I guess I would always argue it's not about either or, hopefully. Yeah. And that's why I like to give the example of Jeremy, you know, um, um, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not like smart work can only be the province of elite specialist professionals, yeah. which is what sometimes people think. It doesn't matter what work you, you do. You can, you can be respected in your work and have some influence and have some connection with other people and so on. So it's not a trade-off, I would say. I think there's been a large-scale study from Manchester University in the UK that looked at the costs of unemployment or poor work, and they found that actually it was worse for you to take these poor quality jobs in terms of your physical health um, and the ah. long-term implications for them. So um, again, yeah. I can put that into um, the website that people could look at. So I, we've been doing a short-term pilot um, looking at people that are transitioning onto um, a, a living wage and what we do find is a real uptick in the, in terms of how they feel connected with their work in different ways but we're yeah. speculating that actually this might be a short-term thing exactly as you said so once you satisfy those needs then they start looking around and thinking actually there are other things that could be going on here so exactly as mm. you say Sharon it's not necessarily an either or maybe it's about a journey that once one set of needs are satisfied for people then other things start becoming uh, more into the frame yeah great comment so we've got uh, another question. Um, yeah, you've got quite a few questions about this overstimulating work and particularly thinking about the IT world and whether people feeling under pressure to process a lot of information and solve problems. And in some ways, you know, that's in a sense, we talk about stimulating work. When it becomes so overstimulating, it becomes a demand, basically, you know, and actually in trying to publish this work, it's one of the arguments that we, because there's all this discussion about demand versus resource and, and so on and so forth. And in some senses, we're almost saying that, you know, sometimes that lack of that resource becomes in itself a demand. So, yeah, so, you know, there's no, and, and, and right now I would say that um, many, many people are, you know, um, over, overstimulated in their work. And, uh, um, you know, this whole notion of people um, that are at work that are loving their work, thriving, but also exhausted. And, yeah. you know, frank, frankly put myself in that category 
some of the time. <laughs> you probably do too, Ros. Is that, you know, is that um, balance? We need balance. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, um, I guess, you know, we're lucky and privileged because often it's self-inflicted, those, those excessive stimuli, you know, excessive demand. And so when we really need to, we can pull it back and, and that's important. Um, but but certainly, yeah, too much of anything, too much stimulation is is going to be ultimately stressful. The the other thing I often have conversations with people about is some people oh people don't want stimulating work, you know. Oh no, you know some people don't like stimul, but it's it's what's stimulating for them, and yes. that varies. And thank goodness it varies, right? Because there are some people who really get stimulated by the sort of work that other people wouldn't be stimulated by. So it's really what, and that comes, I guess, a little bit back to that notion of fit. Um, and I always think about, we employed in my previous university, some intellectually disabled people whose job it was to come to our uh, staff kitchen and to replace the milk and, and the particular lady that used to come just adored her work. She loved it. She took so much pride in it. For her, that was really stimulating work that was interesting. And, and you know, that's the important thing. It's about getting the right fit for, for the person. Yeah. And there's some great resources looking at the Cincinnati Hospital Project that exactly addressed that issue and how actually they had more reliable workers by employing a different category of worker than they would normally have uh, approached um, and used. They had to do different staff training, but it, it really benefited everybody in the community and gave work to people that wouldn't normally have work and made their lives more meaningful. So and, question um, we... Professor, sorry. sorry, just jump yeah. in there, Ros. Um, Professor Fred Zielstra, who some of you might know from the Netherlands, also does fantastic work, which I think is brilliant about inclusion, where, you know, you take some of the demands of the busy professionals um, and create some jobs for people with potential with intellectual disabilities and so on. So you get you get win win for both groups of people. Uh, so I think his work is also very relevant. I will be adding that to the impact incubator. So we've got a question here about how the smart model benefits from a socio technical approach to face the new technology era of digitalization. Yeah, thanks, Jose. I can see your question there. <laughs> and, you know, actually, um, one of our papers, Parker and Grote, that came out in um, EJ WAP, or was it Applied yep. Psych? I've forgotten Applied Psych, maybe it was. That's terrible, isn't it? But um, not doing a very good advertising job. But anyway, um, that was really all about saying with digitalization, really our key argument is, you know, it can go either way. You know, we, we've got like, like, I gave the example of the Uber Eats drivers bored, bored to death, um, but, you know, you can equally see um, cases of, um, of um, taking, you know, you talk about technology replacing the dull, dangerous work. So that makes, that leaves the cognitive tasks that are more interesting. So, so digitalization can sort of go, and in our paper, we talk about that, not just for stimulating, but for agency, you know, look at surveillance, takes away agency. On the other hand, you know, um, digitalization means more knowledge distribution. It can be more agency for people. So um, really what we argue um, is that, um, you know, um, the impact of digitalization on, on work design can be positive, can be negative. Um, but what we have to do is proactively try and shape and make sure that it is positive. And that is exactly a socio-technical approach is absolutely what we need to be doing. And, you know, that's been an approach that's been around since the 1950s. Yeah. But so important now, more important than ever, actually, with, with AI and machine learning and so on. So really great comment. Thank you. So we've got another question that asks, how can you say organisational identification or commitment? So feeling part of the organisation relates to this framework. Do you expect, for instance, it's most closely related to mastery or relational aspects? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I would probably, first of all, I think there's lots of evidence linking work design to commitment. So I would expect this model to apply. And certainly we've taught, I, I've looked at turnover, which is sort of the opposite of commitment almost. Um, I would probably predict that um, relational is, is perhaps, uh, it's interesting. The re where I'm going with that is, 
you know, that the, the self-determination theory talks about the importance of relational, particularly for identification. So I'm, I'm just speculating that maybe relational, feeling part of something, um, feeling connected with other people is particularly important for commitment. That's just a guess. I, I do believe that those aspects of SMART are important for commitment as to which is the most important. That's a good question, um, but I would maybe guess at relational. More research needed. <laughs> More research needed. <laughs> so we've got a question about whether um, your Centre for Transformational Work Design has a certification for using the model in the workplace. Uh, no, there, there, there is a specific website called um, smartworkdesign.com.au where um, there's more free resources um, and there's um, little videos that explain each concept. Um, I'm in the middle of writing a smart work design book. <laughs> but I have to confess I've been in the middle of it for quite some years now. Um, one day that will come out. But yeah, no, look, we haven't got to that point of sort of certifying it, but the model is freely available for anyone to use. Some of the more advanced techniques that we use in our training um, around particularly how to redesign work and, um, you know, that, yeah, there's a lot more to it, I suppose. Um, we do run training programs and things on that, but it's a great question. And thanks to the person for asking. We are trying to get to that point. We just haven't got there yet. Our demands are quite, not quite tolerable enough, but we will get there. And meantime, there's plenty of free resources that you can just use, um, if that makes sense. So we've got a question that comes from um colleagues dialing in from uh, Thailand here and they're asking um, that they will be teaching work design to PhD students tomorrow. So we would just really encourage you to both look at the range of videos that Sharon's got on her website, but also there's a whole range of free resources on our YouTube channel and also on the Impact Incubator site that are designed to help you with your teaching. We um, subtitle them and we try and make things available, particularly our animations in your native language. And if you can help us do those trans translations, then please get in touch with me because we want to make this a website that you curate and help us to identify where the gaps are. We want our, our dream is, if you like, we want to make something in your language available so that you can listen or read what's the science here so that it, it, we can share it across the world. So a final question, uh, and this comes from the Philippines, that many country, companies in the Philippines are exploring a transition to hybrid work arrangements, and I suppose that will enhance agency, but might have a negative impact on the mastery and relational aspects of work. So about applying SMART to those hybrid work arrangements. Any thoughts there, yeah. Sharon, as our last yeah. comment? Such a great question. One of the studies we've just finished, actually, and um, I think we have a little article coming out in Sloan Management Review again on it. We actually measured people. Um, we asked them about their smart work when they're in the office. These were all hybrid workers um, because, mm -hmm. because Perth has been um, lucky with COVID and so we haven't really had so much. We've actually been hybrid working for quite some time. So we measured people's experiences of work when they were... Um, at home and also the same people when they were in the office. And then we've been comparing them. And we find some interesting findings actually. I mean, um, for example, we found that loneliness, most important um, inhibitor of feeling lonely was having good support from people in the office. So, you know, I mean, it's early days with that research and, you know, um, keen to keep doing more research on it but I guess what it what it sort of suggests so far is yeah we have to look at the whole job you know so it's not just about looking at your experience at home or it's it's the whole job that's going to be important and there may well be some you know like I guess some pros and cons um, and we're going to have to look at that sort of fairly holistically to work out what matters but that little finding is quite interesting I think that people feel less lonely if they've got good support in the office their support from their colleagues when they work remotely doesn't have so much impact on feelings of loneliness so um, yeah so early days I think with that research but absolutely this the model can be applied to that context and if you check out our website um, transformativeworkdesign.com um, you will see there's lots and lots of resources on hybrid working and, and remote working uh, that use the SMART model as its framework. 
And I guess that's also why um, early people that are new into jobs and also younger workers are really the um, groups that are most significantly impacted by that loneliness, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so maybe yeah. there's something for us to think about there. Yeah, yeah. So, but again, more research to be done. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just going to share our screen to say we're going to have a five minute break now. Um, again, this is good practice because we're online. So please, can you go and get yourselves a cup of coffee and then come back and find out about the next exciting um, offering that we're making on the Impact Incubator, which is a serious educational game to help people think about these things. So see you in five.
So thank you, Sharon, for your wonderful presentation and really setting off this session to highlight some a whole range of different and small and large things that can be done to make work decent. So I want to, um, I'm not Ishbel Herman McCaw, I just want to acknowledge that sadly um, Ishbel has fallen foul of COVID and so is unable to make this presentation, but she leads the um, Impact Incubator's Decent Work Strand. And so this is a presentation that she and I and a colleague at Glasgow, Matt Orford, have put together that is showing the next stage of the work that we've been trying to do looking at decent work and what can be done. So why have we picked um, an educational game? Let me just give you some science behind these games and get you thinking about them. So educational games have had a variety of different names from serious game, serious educational game or educational simulator. And they have a variety of different things that they're looking at. So educational simulations are designed to be realistic but they're actually quite domain specific. So for example, and we've used these for a long time within work psychology, thinking about fright simulations. Serious games are a next iteration here, and these are a more complex representation of a particular domain, and they require some specific knowledge that again, you're using the game to try and deliver to the individual to, to achieve a particular um, goal. In contrast, serious educational games, and I think that's what we have created here, is the same as those serious games, but they've got a clear pedagogical framework. And so within this game, we've created a suite of resources that would allow you to create the game as a whole course, or you could go into it in different ways and use it in a much shorter and much more focused ways. So again, it would be up to you how you put this together. So they're important and they're becoming increasingly important, I think, both as we look at an, edu a, a, an educational um, population who have grown up with games and who are used to them in different ways. And certainly in preparing for this game, we, um, myself and Ishbel, spent a long time playing some games, which was something that I've done in the past, but I hadn't done uh, and looking at them with a different eye when you're starting to develop them. So the game is fully developed and it's immersive and it's designed to take you into a space and to give you experiences within that space to allow you to think through and again, pull out through the wraparound materials, more insight and self-reflection. So they are very powerful tools and I think increasingly powerful tools. They've been used in a variety of different spaces, particularly thinking, um, for example, about um, some well-known like the Harvard simulations and things, but these are starting to become in that digital space. So there are um, from educational um, research, there are some um, metrics starting to look at how much these um, play a role in having a, a higher efficacy than those traditional resources, both in terms of cognitive, but also effect. So they can create a feeling that people have, and that can be critically important if you are using particularly affect, which is something that work psychology is increasingly paying attention to, to showing how that might change people's cognitions in a different way. So they're also an important space as we start to think more about how we can deliver ethical or moral awareness. And again, they can be useful resources in terms of getting and priming moral sensitivity. So getting people to think about what is the implication of what they're trying to do in a different way. So why a serious game? Well, at one level, it kind of gives you a sort of pleasure in terms of playing a game with a virtual um, environment, but they're a bit more than that, particularly when they're an educational game. So again, it's looking at a more meaningful interaction within a topic. So it's just transforming that experience. As we said, it's about trying to think through moral skills and trying to think through causal connections that somebody might not necessarily be aware of in terms of when they're playing particularly competitive games that we often find within business schools where they might see uh, the goal as being to compete against others rather than understanding how they might build and have a social responsibility in different ways. So although we are seeing an increasing number of games within that domain, 
this is something that we've actively tried to build into our game. But I think above all, games are popular, they're relevant, and they're exciting places um, to work with. So they have a creative value both for the developers, but also for the students and the people using and playing your game. So in terms of thinking through uh, within our game, what we did was we've done a systematic review uh, and this is freely available. It's an open access uh, resource uh, at the Journal of Work and Organizational Psychology, but also on our website that looks through all of the science around um, living wages. And then we also have written uh, an editorial that's about this. So what we were trying to do and through these is really to identify a shift, an important and powerful shift from an economic view as wages as a cost to trying to understand actually the psychological dimensions that these bring into work and therefore transition and have important consequences for the worker and therefore for the employee, employer. So, Currently, a lot of this has not been measured by um, economists. So it, again, it, they purely look at costs because they're not measuring these different aspects. So they can include things like how confident, how self-confident people feel. And that was something that um, Sharon was highlighting in her talk. They also look at questions of sustainability. So in particular, we were interested, and you'll see in the game, it's got particular dimensions that are about people feeling exhausted by having to have multiple jobs in order to maintain a lifestyle or even have a lifestyle. Also, what we found within our review was an, a critical issue to do with capacity enhancing to allow people, and this is something that Sen talks about in terms of having choices things that they have chosen to do. And it was interesting for me looking at Sharon's talk where she was highlighting Jeremy and how Jeremy had chosen to change the space. He'd chosen to actually enhance his capacity to think through the categorizations of objects that he that people were bringing to the dump to think about how he placed them. So again, that was transforming and transformational for the environment as well. It's also about capturing what happens to people when they feel respected and included within society. Also often, particularly when we look at a low paid work, what Frisk has talked about is that it can prime a disgust for people so that they feel that somehow somebody is deserving of the outcomes that have happened to them in their lives and the work that has happened, rather than seeing it as maybe something that they have gone into without necessarily having the same agency because they don't have the human and social capital. So we built a, a serious game because what we wanted to do was to look at the science but also allow people to make decisions and all the way through the game and these are I'm going to be including in this uh, talk some of the snapshots from the game's um, images. So people have decisions to make so we work the context is a retail context and they have to recruit a, a retail assistant and there are two resumes that they're choosing between and they have to weigh up what are the benefits and what are the risks for these two different employees. So it's understanding also thinking about relationships and again that was something that Sharon very much highlighted in her talk. So what we've got is um, Joe who is a manager here and then we have the owner of this um, organization and you can see that the owner is always talking in uh, capitals they're always shouting at the employees and at the manager they're always demanding things from them it also gives us um, opportunities that people make a choice about do you uh, give somebody feedback or reprimand them in a public space or in a private space so again we start to see here and what we've built with the um, aid of some um, outstanding both games makers but also illustrators, we started to look at the faces of our characters. So this is Lee uh, and he's been reprimanded in front of everybody in the store and so he starts, his smile starts to change and turn into a frown here. We also wanted to build in issues about homework interactions to show the spillover consequences for people, both of their private lives into their work lives, but the other way around as well. So again, we've got issues to do with um, family 
engagement and here um, you can make a choice between who gets to look after the baby first thing in the morning for Lee. And so we've got a, a variety of different worlds. So as I said, this is broccoli um, or Lee and we can see there in, in front of the store, we can see the manager's car and we can see Lee's car. So there's there's some similarity there in terms of colours. And again, it was a very interesting space to work with a designer thinking about those colour palettes. But we have the employee and we have the manager. But we're also looking and understanding the relationship and what happens to the manager in terms of working within the space that they have to work in. So we have a retail space. But we also then have second jobs that people have to do. And again, you can make decisions about why somebody would work in that space. What are the benefits for them uh, with Lee in this um, context in particular in working at the petrol uh, station? Is this something that is helpful for, for them in terms of recovering away time away for their family? Is it time that's quiet time that they can do some reading? Or is it actually just a place that they snooze because they're so exhausted from their work? Again, you decide what is happening here. There were also issues about the spaces that people occupy. So this is an example of the staff room and you have a choice to make about what type of staff room, whether it's like this or whether you can make it like this. So again, thinking about how that feels for the employees as they come into this space and as, are they participating and enabled to make contributions and suggestions for that space? Or does the organisation see that they're spending too long in this space and want to move them out? So the wraparound materials that we have shortly available, they look at understanding what makes um, negative attributions and stereotypes happen. What happens where you go from a positive to a negative? They found that these wraparound materials are really key to unpacking the learning at a, um, a high level. And that's what we were trying to do and why it's a serious educational game. So it's similar in terms of training effectiveness that if you embed it in the task and try and get more out of it by identifying some key self-reflection opportunities and understanding causal connections. Again, within the game, what we've tried to do is to use the science. So all of the roots are based on scientific evidence. It is a work in progress. So the pandemic has had a critical impact on us in terms of being able to get real user feedback. We could get virtual user feedback, but we would really like to get some more feedback from our users, particularly in this first iteration. So the game that we will be launching very shortly is the version one, and we want to involve you in doing some further testing. We're going to have registration for it. So again, all of the people who have registered for this event will automatically get an update, allowing them um, to then go forward and use the game and access those wraparound materials. But we would like to do that so that you give us some feedback about it because it's a work in progress at the minute. We also want to develop, as we do with all of the work that we're doing within the EWOP Impact incubator, a community of practice. So we want to make it a sharing space that people add further to the resources, things that they're using it for. And so please go and register at our website um, to get more information, but also to become part of the community as we go through. So what I'd like to do now is to play um, a trailer for the game before um, it launches fully. So let me see if this is going to work. No. Right, hang on just one minute. So let me host it. Uh, hang on. Sorry, let me share a different screen that's got the trailer on it. Okay. Right. 
sorry, technical issue, just let us sort this out. It should be able to share with the sound. I've got share sound. I'm really sorry, this doesn't appear to be working as we'd intended. Um, we have gone through a run through. It's always, <laughs> there's always a free zone of danger when you try and add these things. It is available on our YouTube channel. If you want to have a look at it, it gives you a preview of the game in detail. And I'd like to um, just share now our bibliography. Um, so this is all the references uh, that I mentioned before in the um, earlier talk. So let me now uh, stop sharing my screens and look at any questions that you might have for me about this new enterprise. Oh, sharing it in the chat. That's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. If you just want to put in your um, comments into the chat that would be very helpful while I just search through. So we have a whole variety of different things available in that YouTube channel, including the trailer. And you'll see that there are things to do with um, Silence is Golden, which is another animation looking at the Im impact of silence within organisations, but there's also something that looks um, at why do people do bad things? And again, that's highlighting some critical issues to do with how we select and recruit people. So uh, so oh, now I've lost you, sorry. So I'm going to put this into the chat, but you have to promise that you'll look at it in a minute. <laughs> so as I said, COVID has had quite an impact on us in terms of our team uh, very recently. Um, there's been an uptick in terms of uh, the prevalence of the disease in Scotland. And so a number of our staff that we needed to help us do the final launch. We have produced both an education pack for, um, that's in three step, three say. We, uh, the first is to do with reflection and getting people to think and engage and identify with different characters and try and look at that affective dimension and why they might associate and identify with one group more than others. Then the second is a series of different um, exercises that can be done that draw out specific things. So for example, it looks at recruitment and how you might go about recruiting um, for these retail assistants. Second, are looking at the relationships and looking at voice and how that works within the organization. And then the final is looking at getting you to think about applying some of the things that um, Sharon was talking about in terms of how do we go about creating decent work and what are the challenges for that. So. Ishbel sends her love to everyone. Uh, I was in touch with her yesterday and this morning, um, but sadly she's not been able to do this presentation. I hope I've been able to do it some justice. We will be subtitling this and we will be subtitling Sharon's talk and putting them all onto our website. I think this event has been very useful for us in terms of, and we will be downloading the chat that you've created to try and identify some further content um, and certainly the comments that Sharon was making about Fred Zilstra's work, we will be reaching out to Fred to try and include some more content there as we expand this decent work component. You'll see there's going to be future um, content 
that's particularly around young people. Again, there's brief new briefing packs there. There's also some work looking at women and minority groups. There was a small group meeting that happened in January and they are actively looking at doing some more work there. There's also a small group meeting happening in Amsterdam in June that's going to be looking at counterproductive work behaviour and particularly trying to look upstream at what can we do to prevent counterproductive work behaviour in the workplace. And again, I'm kind of guessing and previewing that. I wonder whether so much of the work design stuff that Sharon's shared with us so um, carefully and so insightfully today will really help us in terms of taking that forward and understanding why do people do bad things in organisations. We would really like your help with the Impact Incubator. We see ourselves as really a showcase for the great work that other people are doing and we want to use the skills and the resources that we have to amplify some wonderful examples of work psychology that can make the world a better place for everybody, for workers, for employers, and also for society, because we are embedded in this world. And I think if anything, the pandemic has really shown us how connected we all are. And recent events in the East are also showing us how connected we are. We also, just on that note, will be adding some content looking at migration and how to make migration work for people because again that's really something in terms of global challenges that it's likely if we don't do something about climate change we are going to have people migrating around the world because their places that they currently live in are no longer viable for war but also for climate change issues so thank you for your time today uh, and thank you particularly to Sharon for sharing with us all of your work and also the websites there so thank I you I thought I'd come back on to say goodbye as well yeah no <laughs> please do please do so yeah if you're not a member or you would like to share and and get other people we've got a, a contact sheet that you can sign into with the eBOP impact incubator tell us what you're particularly interested in but as I said if you've got suggestions as to things that would make a difference for you please share them with us and then we can use that to send resources to things that matter to you that's our goal we want to make a difference and help you to make a difference okay so thank you so much i'm getting some lovely comments on the chat sheet and i'm and thank you again for your time we'll send you out an email when this is subtitled and available for you to use um, and again please go and visit our youtube channel where you'll find our previous events all recorded there in small group small bytes so that you can use them in your teaching that's what we're designing it for so i think that could be a wrap <laughs> thank you bye bye thanks Sharon. thanks ross see you everyone see you everyone bye bye